All right, so Vantage are kind of a few of my favorite lectures in this class, actually, uh, talking about Turkey, Iran, and Iraq after World War II. And we're obviously going to do more than one lecture on this. Today we're going to kind of focus in on Turkey after World War II. And on all three of these nations, just to kind of set things up for you, because it's going to be kind of another big theme, you're going to need to know, you know, what are the domestic events and what are the foreign policy events that impacted these three nations. Uh, so again, you'll have to know about Turkey domestically and foreign policies of theirs, Iran and Iraq. Right, so those are the three that we're going to be covering uh, over the next few lectures here. So I think you'll find this interesting. I hope so. Um, and we'll start by just kind of having a quick reminder of what the deals with Turkey. That's of course their their national flag, and we're going to go through a bunch of different things here. So here we go. So we'll start with just a review. 1923 is when you know Turkey gets its independence after World War One. Right, we had talked about the conferences. Uh, after the war, and as we also mentioned, Mustafa Kemal comes in and takes over, right? He is that great hero from the Battle of Gallipoli. Uh, the new capital of Turkey becomes the city of Ankara, and one of the things about Mustafa Kemal that you definitely want to note are his reforms. I only put a few of them up here, but you definitely want to know them, uh, because what you see with his reforms is he's definitely trying to bring Turkey to a more Western style of a society. So he changes the alphabet, as it says there, and he bases it more on a Latin script alphabet as opposed to, you know, what you had uh, in previous times under the Ottoman period. He gives women the right to vote in 1934. Uh, he creates a more secular legal system. And what I mean by that is the next point there, Sharia courts are abolished. So, you know, under many Islamic powers, they follow Sharia law. Sharia law is Islamic law. And Mustafa Kemal says, no, we want to be a more secular society. We don't want our laws based on the Quran. We want our laws based on, you know, legal ideas of, of you know, what we think of non-religious laws, even though, of course, a lot of our non-religious laws are based on religious ideas. But it's not, this is what it says in the Quran, and this is how we're going to punish people, and so forth. So these are, are pretty important reforms. They, they kind of westernize. He also improves the economy in Turkey, modernizes the economy. Uh, he's a very important man. Um, definitely, your textbook talks about him a little bit more. Uh, you could talk, read the book about him as well. Uh, but definitely you want to know about Mustafa Kemal. Now, that's all still pre-World War II. Then when we talked about World War II, we mentioned this man named Unonu. Who, he comes in and he's going to be the new president from 1938 all the way until 1950. And afterwards, he's still going to be involved in politics, uh, but then they'll have other leaders. So that's just kind of a quick little summary. So now let's talk about what happens after World War II. So one of the key things that Iran is involved in after World War II is the Cold War. And so here's some key terms for the Cold War. And I definitely want you, I say Iran, I'm sorry, Turkey is involved in, uh, is the Cold War. And so get these key terms down, and then I'm going to show you how this relates to Turkey and the Cold War. All right, so if you need to pause, just jot down these quick little terms, and we'll get going. So here's our map of the Cold War, and you could see here is Turkey, of course, down here on the bottom part of the map. And the whole idea of the Cold War is you had this, you know, World War, World War II ends, and you have what is called this Iron Curtain. That's that line going down the center part of Europe. I'm hoping you've heard that term before, the Iron Curtain. And that Iron Curtain, that, that line there, is the, the, the dividing line between the areas that fell under the Soviet sphere and the areas that fall under the Western democratic spheres. And Turkey and Greece, actually, are both kind of right there on the border, as you could see. And the concern in the United States was that, the, that they knew they couldn't, after World War II, go into the Soviet Union and force the Soviet Union to give freedom to all these nations that they conquered at the end of World War II, like Poland, like East Germany, like Romania, like Hungary, everything you see there in green. And so since the United States didn't feel they can go in and push the Soviet Union out, instead what the United States issued was something called the containment policy. And the containment idea is just contain it. If communism is in control of East Germany, don't let it go to West Germany. If it's in Romania, don't let it go to another country and, and down to Greece, you know, wherever it is. Don't let it spread. 
And it was a global idea. If it's in North Korea, don't let it go to South Korea. If it's in one part of Asia, don't let it go to another part of Asia. You, know, you get the idea. And it was true in the Middle East as well, that the United States wanted to contain communism. And Turkey, because of its location, becomes very significant. And as a result of this containment idea, what happens is with Turkey a couple things. One of the things that happens is Turkey is going to be given a lot of aid by the United States in what is called the Truman Doctrine. So in 1947, President Truman issued the Truman Doctrine, which gave hundreds of millions of dollars, $400 million precisely, to Turkey, right? Again, you want to get all these details down, as always, based on the words I just showed you before. And so it was given to Turkey and to Greece, actually. It gave $400 million to Turkey and Greece. And the idea behind that was to, to get them on our side, to build up their economy. They saw kind of an ally in Turkey because they were more secular because of Mustafa Kemal. Um, and strategically, look how close Turkey is to the Soviet Union and all those Cold War Eastern Bloc nations. It made a lot of sense. This is also the reasons why all these years there's been very little pressure by the United States against Turkey to make them acknowledge the Armenian Genocide. It's precisely because of this Cold War issue, actually, and even today, even though the Cold War is over, Turkey is also part of NATO. So you have the issue of NATO as well. NATO, of course, stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Again, if you need to get that down, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And Turkey was invited to be part of NATO. And the most important part of NATO is Article 5 of the NATO Charter, which states an attack on one is an attack on all. And so Turkey loves being part of NATO because therefore they, they know they don't have to worry about a Soviet intervention against them. And very quickly, Turkey becomes an ally of the United States and these other Western powers. So one of the more significant roles of Turkey during the period after World War II is they become part of NATO, they become an ally of the United States. And I don't know if you're familiar, like, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had missiles in Turkey facing the Soviet Union. Um, and so all of this is important because, you know, if you look at strategic strategy in terms of a war, having that close of a place inside, you know, bordering the Black Sea and all these areas uh, was very useful. So that was one very significant post-World War II thing you need to know about Turkey, that they were allied with the United States, they were part of NATO, they were supported through the Truman Doctrine. All of that is very important. Okay, so that's one thing I definitely want you to know about. So we continue now. We talked about, obviously, that pretty big event foreign policy-wise, I guess you could say, because, you know, they're connected with other countries. Domestically, Turkey's also going through some interesting things in the 1950s and 60s. And so domestically, there's going to be a new president elected in 1950, a man named Salal Bayar. And this man, Salal Bayar, is different than um, Mustafa Kemal and Unonu. Because Salad Bayar, he comes from a different party, the Democratic Party, uh, as it was called. It has nothing to do with our Democratic Party, but that's just what they were called. And they were much more pushing the idea of theocracy in Turkey. And this is something that Turkey has had to deal with for a very long time, since modern times. What is Turkey? Is it a religious Islamic state or is it a secular state like Mustafa Kemal wanted? And it kind of goes back and forth. I found this one article, this is several years ago about, uh, but it was a big march in Turkey. And it said some 12,000 people from 100 pro-secular associations waved Turkish flags as they marched through the mausoleum of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the, modern, the father of modern Turkey. The Turkey is secular and it will remain secular, they chanted during a march broadcast live on television. And so you get these kind of stories a lot, just a news article from a few years back, about how there's constant demonstrations and, and conflict. What is Turkey? Is it a religious nation uh, like the other Middle Eastern nations, more of a theocracy ruled by religious leaders, or is it a secular nation? And Salat Bayar kind of more leaned towards more of the theocracy, and it created a little bit of issues inside of Turkey. Uh, there were some other issues with him. Uh, there was apparently issues with money. There was a lot of inflation during his time. The unit of money known as the lira oh, just became completely devalued. 
Uh, and he was also a bit more autocratic than Mustafa Kemal or Nonu, that he uh, shut down media outlets. Uh, there are stories of how uh, media editors, newspaper editors were placed in prison during his time. And so he was much more controlling, much more authoritarian uh, than what we saw in the previous two presidents. And not a surprise, this actually leads to a coup. Uh, there are quite a few actually in Turkey attempted coups. And in 1960, there was a coup. Um, and during this coup, uh, what ended up happening is Salad Bayar was removed from power. He had a, a prime minister, a man named Menderes, who was hung actually. Um, and it was just kind of going to shift back to secularism. And so we definitely do see this kind of back and forth coming in during this time. Uh, the person who initially replaced Salad Bayar was this man named General Gursel in 1960. And this is sometimes referred to as the Second Turkish Republic uh, because they saw kind of the, the period of Bayar as kind of this, this bad time. And now we're back to more a, a and he is a general and military coup. All uh, right, that took place. So this was not just, oh, they had another election and they put him out of power. They, they had a coup. So even though we think of Turkey as kind of being a democracy, a democratic nation, it's not always that smooth. I mean, you know, for all the political turmoil you have in every democratic nation, uh, you usually don't have military generals coming in and, and overthrowing the elected official. But people felt that that's how corrupt it was becoming under under uh, Bayar. So you had General Gorsel, he comes in as the new president in 1960, and then you get the Second Turkish Republic. After that, you know, Turkey kind of again fluctuates a bit as well. I gave you the name of Erdogan before, um, you know, Erdogan again, he is the prime minister of Turkey when you get to 2020. And, you know, Erdogan, he's faced the coup as well. Uh, Erdogan is very much um, in more of the theocracy side. And this is still a conflict all the way until, you know, modern times in Turkey. What is Turkey? Uh, one of the things I saw recently in 2020, Erdogan did, is he declared something small, but I think interesting. Uh, Hagia Sophia, that, that big church that would became a mosque uh, in Constantinople, which later became Istanbul, then became a museum. And now they're saying, no, 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 it's no longer a museum. We're going to designate it a mosque again which is, again, moving away from secularism and more towards making uh, Turkey more of an Islamic-centered state. So that's just kind of an interesting domestic event Turkey has been going through quite a bit. So you definitely want to know about all that um, and, and be familiar with everything there. All right, so I hope all that's clear. And now we get into uh, another interesting dynamic story that a lot of people haven't ever heard of before, but was a pretty big part of modern Turkish history after World War II. And it's about a tiny little island called Cyprus. Not our Cyprus, different Cyprus, spelled differently, so be careful on that. But here's the island of Cyprus. It's not that big. You can see it's just off the coast of Turkey. But you can see it's also not that far away from Greece. And keep in mind, Greece and Turkey are technically allies um, because they're both part of NATO. Uh, but what you're going to get as a result of the story is some pretty heated conflict between Turkey and Greece over the issue of Cyprus. So Cyprus is an island, you know, it's changed hands many times in history. Um, it's been, it's an island. Sometimes it was controlled by different civilization. In the 1800s, it was controlled by the British and well, it's not the British's land. Uh, the question is who's living in Cyprus? And it's a combination primarily of Greeks and Turks. Uh, the majority of the people who lived in Cyprus were actually Greeks, right? That was the, the majority people. I think it was about 70, 80% of the people who lived on the island of Cyprus were Greeks who are Christians. And there were Turks, who, of course, are Muslims. And, you know, there was a discussion of what do we do with this island? And there was a really important movement. In fact, actually, before I go forward, let me go and show you some key words on this. So here are the key words that I want you to get down on this. So go ahead, just kind of, I'll talk about them and jot them down. And I'm going to go to a couple more images here. Uh, so Greece and Turkey, right, these are the two issues. They, they, there's an idea known as a gnosis. And what is that idea? Well, it literally means unification. 
and there was a big movement both in Greece and for many people in Cyprus that Cyprus should be part of Greece because the majority of people there were Greeks and a lot of them wanted to be there. But Turkey was very upset about this. They didn't want Cyprus to be part of Greece because look how close it was to, to Turkey and the two, even though they were part of NATO together, had these rivalries. And so there was a bit of concern. This led to a conference in 1959, the London Conference, uh, where the British were there because the British had control of the island uh, along with Greece and Turkey. And they decide what to do, what to do, what to do. And as a result of the 1959 London Conference, a few things were, were done. So we want to, of course, get all this down. Uh, one, it was decided that Cyprus would be independent, that it would not be part of Greece and it would not be part of Turkey. It would not be part of the British. It would be an independent nation. Two, a few points here that the island of Cyprus would be treat everybody on the island fairly. That, in other words, even though the Turkish people were the minority, their rights would be preserved, um, that they could practice their faith and religion. That was all part of the agreement. What they also agreed on is that there would be kind of a 70-30 split politically for political power. That if you have a parliament building, the ratio had to be 70-30. Why is that? Well, that 70, 70 of the seats would be belong to the, the Greeks and 30 would belong to the Turks. Why? Well, because if everything was simply majority vote, the, the Turks would get zero, right? Because every single election they would lose 70% to 30% or 80% to 20%, whatever the numbers were. And so at least the Turkish gets some representation on the island of Cyprus. The Turkish people who live on the island of Cyprus would get that representation. So that was the idea. And then they would have an election and they would elect a new president, a new leader of Cyprus. And so that was kind of the idea. Another point they agreed to is there would be two official languages that there would be both Greece and Turkey as the official language there. And again, all that the Turkish minority would be have all their civil rights protected. All of that was part of the agreement. And then they have the election. So who do they elect? Well, not a surprise, the person who's gonna be elected is gonna be Greek. Let me show you a man named Makarios. I'm gonna so get down the rest of the key terms here if you didn't get them down, uh, because I'm gonna talk about the rest of this in the next couple slides here. So if you need a pause, get it down. But the guy elect is a man named Makarios. What does Makarios look like? Here he is. And it doesn't take long to see this guy is not just Greek, but he's very Greek, right? He's a Greek religious leader. He's the archbishop of the church. Um, and so he's clearly a man who was in the mentality of supporting Greece and really deep down still wanted Enosis. He still wanted Cyprus and Greece to be connected. So, you know, people in Turkey weren't happy about this, but for the time being, it was okay for a couple of years until we get to 1963. 1963, Makarios began the process of openly talking about bringing back Enosis. He proposed constitutional changes that would limit the right of the Turkish population there. Uh, so again, that's important, especially Turkish, to take away the, the rights of the, the, the civil rights of the minority groups there. And obviously, Turkey was so very upset about this. Turkey was so upset about this that there was even discussions of Turkey invading Cyprus. In your packet, you have a really interesting source, a letter from Lyndon Johnson to Turkey. You want to read that letter and well long story short after you read that letter uh, you'll see why Turkey didn't go forward with this invasion. Uh, so you definitely want to read it. You want to be familiar with it. It's a really good primary source document from, Le from President Johnson uh, to, uh, to leaders of Turkey saying hey do not invade Cyprus. And why did the United States not want Turkey to invade Cyprus? Well because if Turkey invades Cyprus then Greece is going to be upset and remember, both Greece and Turkey are NATO allies. So they're like, we don't need this mess right now between Greece and Turkey, especially in the heart of the Cold War. It's the last thing they wanted. So that was 1964. Turkey backed off, and, and the United States kind of had a little chit chat with Makarios, and they said, you know, be good, be good, be good, and things calmed down. They, they didn't, you know, suppress the minority rights, and things were okay for a few more years. Till 1974. 1973, 1974, 
Um, Makarios is still in charge. Um, he's still pushing this Enosis idea. The Greeks were actually getting a little concerned about him. And he was replaced, Makarios, by a man named Nico Samson. And that was the other key term there. So even the Greeks at this point are like, you know, this Makarios guy, he might be too much issues. Um, and so he was changed out of power and Nico Samson took over. But Turkey still didn't care. Turkey at this point, after years of Makarios, really felt that the, the Turkish population in Cyprus were being mistreated. And they, in fact, launched an invasion. And in 1974, I believe it was, uh, they did actually launch an invasion onto Turkey. And the United States, of course, busy with other things. Greece wasn't happy about it. What did this invasion lead to? Well, let me show you a map. Um, and this is what the invasion led to. It led to this island of Cyprus basically being split. Um, it was it was a very difficult thing, you know, about 40,000 troops landed on Cyprus, Turkish troops. The Greeks didn't really have the, the time to do anything. Uh, Turkey is not going to try to control all of Cyprus because they realize the majority of people there are Greeks. And so you could see what happens. The southern part is Greek. The northern part becomes what is called the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Uh, the only country that really recognizes the Turkey Republic of Northern Cyprus is Turkey. Uh, and then there's this kind of wall that's kind of sometimes referred to as um, the, the um, bear, there's this kind of dividing wall. I think it's called the Green Wall or something. Um, and it's just this kind of wall that separates them. And there's this little UN buffer zone. And ever since then, these two areas have been split. I, I see different news articles sometimes they, they talk about getting rid of that kind of line but for them and them being together then there are other times where hardliners take in and no nobody wants to give a bit it's relatively peaceful today but it did create a problem it created a number of refugees um, you know it created some diplomatic tension between the United States and Turkey um, and that's still an issue today, you know, this diplomatic relationship between the United States and Turkey. Uh, so, you know, this island of Cyprus actually is a small little island, but did create a lot of tension between the U.S. and Turkey and Greece and so forth. So, again, the end result is that you have the island of Cyprus split, you know, today. And part of it is controlled by independent Cyprus and part of it is basically a little puppet of Turkey, the northern uh, area. All right, so I hope all that's clear, but that's the other big event that, that, that gripped Turkey post-World War II. So there you go. That's just a little summary of some of the events of Turkey. And as I mentioned, you know, I think the last kind of point I want to make here about, you know, Turkey and the United States and um, the tension, it is a, a, it's a, a alliance, but it's a very tense alliance. It's an alliance that, that works for practical reasons. Uh, because of the geography of where Turkey is located. And you say the Cold War is over. Yeah, but, you know, Turkey is also really close to the rest of the Middle East. And you think of things like 9-11 and after 9-11, how much we needed help from that area to, to, to deal with, you know, fighting off um, Al-Qaeda and, and ISIS and so forth. And so it, it's a bit challenge to do Turkey, I'm, you know, in terms of the relationship. There's concern also about how Turkey, you know, supports some terrorist groups even today uh, in the Middle East. There's there's issues of that. And again, is Turkey a secular, a theocracy? Uh, so these are all issues that still kind of grip Turkey all the way until today. Anyway, so I hope that's just a little brief summary of Turkey after World War II. So again, you've got a few big highlights to think about to remember. Obviously, the reforms in Mustafa Kemal, the Cold War issue, the Truman Doctrine, uh, the political maneuverings like Salah Bayar and Gursel, and then the Cyprus issue. And again, just know that Erdogan guy again as well. All right. I hope all that's clear. If you have any questions, please let me know. And then we're going to move on to the, the, to the other nations here in the next lectures. Bye.